So about a week ago, you announced uh, Big Little. Yes. So what is that? So um, let me start with a step earlier than that. Uh, a week ago, we announced uh, a processor called the Cortex A7, which is uh, our most energy efficient pro application processor to date. And it's geared towards de uh, delivering uh, today's high-end uh, smartphone performance in the cost effectiveness of a sub-$100 smartphone. So the Cortex A7 is targeted for that kind of market. And what we talked about after that, as you said, Big Little, is the ability to seamlessly combine the Cortex A7 and the Cortex A15 into a uh, combination that provides extremely high-end performance and increased battery life all at the same time. Uh, and that is what we call Big Little. It's an approach where transparent to software and middleware, transparent to pretty much most of the OS, existing mechanisms of the OS, we can actually provide a very rapid uh, task migration between processors uh, so that when you need very heavy performance uh, gaming, web rendering, you're running on a Cortex A15, when you need lots of efficiency for a lot of the always on, always connected tasks, uh, you're operating on the A7 because it provides the most power efficient performance that you'd expect for that kind of workload. So is it a way uh, to say like uh, you have a dual core maybe, 1.2 gigahertz, and then you have a little dual core, smaller dual core also, doing uh, like a lower frequency? Next yes. So the uh, the types of configurations we're going to see are going to be dependent on our partners, and that's where you'll see a lot of uh, innovation. Uh, the higher end performance you'll see between the Cortex A15 is probably between 1.2 1.5 gigahertz dual cores, as you said. Uh, the, the little cores could be uh, as high as 1.2 gigahertz, uh, could be operating slower if they need to be, uh, and being even more efficient. Again, you could do one to four cores on either side, uh, but the key point is that they're connected through a cache coherent interconnect, have a common view of, of interrupts from an OS standpoint, simplifying all the software stack above them to utilize this capability. So, the ARM processor is not built in a way that basically it automatically goes down in power consumption when you don't use it. It's it's better to have separate pair or a separate uh, processor that is optimized for low power. Not really. Every ARM processor will be designed for its sweet spot of power and uh, uh, performance. Uh, the Cortex A15, Cortex A9, any of the products that you're seeing today will certainly be able to turn off any piece of logic that they're not using and save power that way. You'll be able to uh, move the frequency down, the voltage down to get more uh, energy benefit that way. We're doing that. We're doing all of that. It's always been there, no? It's always been there. What this gives you is a step of doing even more. Even because, more. Because when you look at uh, smaller workloads and smaller processors, you can always design them much more efficiently. And if you can utilize that extra efficiency, that's where you get the additional benefits. Uh, we, in fact, look at common workloads, and using this, you can get possibly almost 70% energy savings over today's cores that already do this kind of DDFS. Uh, and we expect our partners to be able to squeeze out even more. Nice. So, so basically, it's better to physically have two separate uh, kind of like, uh, but it's one processor, but there's two separate parts of it. You're right. So. The, what you've put about is, is really true. Uh, it looks like one processor from a software standpoint. There are two physical processors underneath, but that seamless uh, transition between them to give you maximum efficiency. If you look at uh, why this is, you're using the right tool for the right task. And especially in energy and power constrained environments, that's exactly what's needed. If you look at a, an app processor uh, chip today, a system on a chip for a phone, that same uh, chip will contain multi-core CPUs, multi-core GPUs, multi-core video, uh, audio, etc. All rolled into one because you're trying to maximize the efficiency uh, for the power consumed. Uh, we're using the same concept in general purpose computing with Big Little, using the right tool for the right task for the maximum efficiency. So basically an ARM uh, A15 is going to have an A7 no matter what, and an A7 is going to have an A15 no matter what, but they're still different. Well, no, actually A7s can be used on their own. You look at high-end uh, or low-cost or entry-level smartphones, uh, you could look at uh, consumer devices. Cortex A7 is a multiprocessor core in its own right and will be used independently. The Cortex A15 
is a normal core in its own right, an enterprise core in its own right, and will be used independently. Big Little gives you a way to uh, put them together for very extreme uh, ranges of operation while giving you better energy efficiency. You'll see this more in mobile, but you couldn't be, uh, uh, I wouldn't be surprised, if you will, uh, to see it in other consumer markets as well. But uh, the Big Little concept is also present in, when the chips with A15 ship is, is in, in both. It's not only for the A7? Yeah, so Big Little concept will show up where both processors are present. And as I said, most likely you'll see this in uh, smartphone platforms first and possibly tablet platforms. And uh, when you have an A15 in an in a A7, it's basically the compatibility or it's also the performance? It's not going to be the full A15 performance? Or? It, it will not give you necessarily the performance of the full A15, but in terms of software, it's identical. It will be able to run all the software that the A15 runs on the A7. So whether it's Neon, whether it's Floating Point, all of these are very competitive for the performance points. It's just that you have a range of performance points now available with the Cortex-A7 and the Cortex-A15. So the A7 is a much smaller chip? or Yes, so it's much smaller area on the chip. You will expectedly see Cortex-A15 and Cortex-A7 all on the same chip. It's just that it's a different processor, but connected together to look like the same with the big one. So how will the performance be different on an A7 and an A15? Uh, in general, you're looking at uh, uh, the A7 providing you the performance level of today's uh, mainstream phones and, and possibly scaling up to the high end. The A15 actually pushes the performance level well beyond that. So as we said, we could get uh, most of today's um, you know, Cortex and Yang based from performance today and then the A15 pushes it to multiple times that. Nice, so lots of sub $100 smartphones thanks to this uh, new technology, and, uh, but that's disruptive, isn't it? We do believe so, and certainly uh, uh, the, the level of performance expected from the Cortex-A7 and the level of benefit it provides for a sub $100 market, which we expect in 2014-2015 to be nearly a billion per year, uh, it does change the game for what becomes the starting point of your internet experience, and uh, a big little story makes it that much more of having uh, personalized computing devices that are beyond what you expect today. So, so which one is more likely to be the most popular? Uh, from experience, smaller cores have more applications that can use them, and in terms of usage and licensing, smaller cores always outnumber the bigger cores. So, so this we do expect the Cortex-A7 to be licensed a lot more, but the Cortex-A15 has already been licensed about <laughs> 14 times, and we expect that to grow too. So right here, you're not actually uh, sampling, or what's it called, it's not tape tapped out, so the 15 is coming out in 2012, this one is a little bit later, right? So, uh, in, in its separate guise, the Cortex-A7 may be in silicon uh, products next year. Realistically, for uh, if you look at the sub-$100 handset market, you might see it in 2013. Um, but the Cortex-A7 is available now, and most of the licensees for the Cortex-A7 have had access to it for quite a few months. So, we'll actually see the shortening of the timescale from this announcement to actual silicon. What kind of demos are you showing? So this demo actually shows a uh, big little in operation. Uh, it is actually running a, an unmodified an Android browser uh, and Android generated stack, uh, which we have uh, given a, a, an open source firmware layer underneath, and it plugs into the standard OS uh, power management policy mechanisms. So what you see here is a red line showing the uh, required level of performance for the workload. The black line is the processor uh, that, that's providing that workload. If it's zero here, it means it's on the little core. Uh, and the one here means it's on the big core. What you see is there's a new page load. The required performance level goes up. It switches to the big core. Uh, as it sees, the, the threshold's kind of at the top of the big core performance. And as it goes through uh, scrolling, it goes through uh, kind of re-rendering -re stuff, it's still on the big core. Once you're done with that and you're actually viewing, uh, it gets down to the little core again, where you can still do scrolling, the OS management is still going on, but you can comfortably operate on the little core. Uh, obviously the speed of this is uh, uh, orders of magnitude slower than what you'll see in uh, uh, actual devices, and these transitions, because of the way we've done it, are so tiny, <laughs> in orders of tens of microseconds, 
that uh, you can aggressively go between them and save the maximum amount of uh, power while giving you all the performance when needed. Uh, are there some uh, similar things some of the chip ARM chip makers are doing already or planning to do? Like Marvel wants to have a little coprocessor on the, they called it the tri-core tri before, and NVIDIA has announced that the Tegra 3 will have a little coprocessor. And is it the OMAP 5 has a Cortex-M? Yes. Is it similar? So they all have a, a grounding in the fact that you use the right core for the right task. If you look at what Marvell have shown and uh, NVIDIA have shown, they have shown uh, effectively big little in action. They have multiple cores that are higher performance and cores that are lower, uh, I mean lower power that you can switch between. Uh, the OMAP 5 shows you you can use dedicated uh, microcontrollers for specific tasks. So again, it's a question of using different types of cores. What we are talking about with Big Little is kind of a, the next step of that, which is there's a complete software um, uh, transparency to it and uh, the capability to operate seamlessly between them. But you're right, all these concepts are very much the uh, heart and soul of uh, our Big Little is it going to be totally automatic when you have an Android? Is it just going to automatically choose the right core? Or do you need to tell the app to do, hey, let's go in a small core and a big core? The idea behind this and uh, the way it works anyway is the application doesn't care. Uh, the middleware doesn't care. And pretty much all of the OS doesn't care. It's a, uh, it can plug directly into the power, power management policy of the OS uh, through a driver and operate underneath or the OS scheduler may take more charge if it wants to and schedule accordingly. But either way, the application doesn't care and the middleware doesn't care.